Good morning and welcome to the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Uh, I'm very pleased to be here with several of my favorite colleagues who are going to give you the lowdown on the President's trip to Latin America and some of the Americas and Mexico City. And we have a lot of important matters to discuss right now, but I have to clear up one thing before we even go. My name tag says Mr., but we have a Dr. DeShazo, a Dr. Mendelssohn Foreman, and a Secretary Aldonis here. So, <laughs> so I should just say, say that before we get going. And with that, let me throw it to Peter. Good morning, everybody. Um, the Obama administration is off to a good start with its relations with, with the Americas. Uh, the President's visit to Canada, President Lula's visit to the U.S., the Vice President's meetings with regional leaders in Chile and Costa Rica, Secretary of State Clinton, uh, Secretary Napolitano, Attorney General Holder to Mexico, and now the uh, President's trip to, uh, to Mexico City and to the, to the summit of the Americas. It's really a, an extraordinary concentration uh, on an area that hasn't gotten uh, quite so much attention uh, recently. Um, the Mexico visit comes at a difficult time for Mexico, a confluence of highly negative factors. The U.S. economy uh, is, and the Mexican economy are tightly linked and the turndown in the United States has had perhaps a greater effect in Mexico than most other countries in the region. Mexico is looking at negative uh, GDP. In 2009, um, its export sector was, is, is strongly affected by the downturn. Um, the uh, maquila industries of, of the northern Mexico and the Mexican automobile sector and auto parts are very, very closely linked to the U.S. Uh, remittances from uh, Mexicans in the United States back home are down. Oil production is falling. Uh, Mexico derives about 40 percent of its state revenues from taxes on Pemex, the state oil company, and of course the drug violence that's been spiking uh, as a result of the activities of the, of the drug cartels has, has captured a lot of, uh, of attention recently. So Mexico is in a difficult um, period right now. and um, Part of the, the task of President Obama's presence will be to reassure Mexicans of U.S. Uh, US support and cooperation on economic, trade, and security issues. The Summit of the Americas in Trinidad and Tobago, Port of Spain. This is the fifth, fifth summit bringing together the, the OAS member nations. Um, the agenda, probably the key, the key issue, um, will be the economic crisis and the response to it. Um, five countries in the region participated in the recent G20 meeting. They're the sort of they're the, the countries that have been, been most closely involved in, in this, but everyone will be looking at the uh, and listening to uh, what President Obama says on the plans to reactivate the U.S. economy. Security, public safety in the region will be an important issue. Uh, there's been a crime wave in many parts of the region, and there's a lot of concern about international crime, drug trafficking, um, and many other, many other kinds of, of organized crime. Uh, human development, the environment, energy security, those are all on the agenda. Um, one of the important goals uh, of the agenda is to revitalize the summit process after a, an unsuccessful summit in Mar del Plata in 2005 uh, to, to give a new emphasis to regional cooperation. And finally, the issue of Cuba, which is uh, Certainly, is not a, it's not officially on the agenda, but it will certainly be raised, and um, there will be considerable interest in uh, U.S. positions on Cuba and expression of support from various countries uh, to differing degrees um, about reintegrating Cuba into the inter-American. Uh, process Cuba was was uh, suspended from active membership in the OAS in 1962, and is not a member of. It's not a participant in the summer in the summit process. I'll stop there. Uh, hi, it's Grant Haldona. So I'm just going to touch on a couple of the economic points, and then some of the trade side uh, briefly before turning it to questions. Um, uh, the first thing is uh, the President came away from the G20, I think, with really strong marks personally. Um, in particular, the G20 itself outperformed everybody's expectations. I think uh, 
Uh, most of the people in the currency markets were shorting the G20 uh, before it happened, but in fact the things that they did produce with respect to the IMF, uh, increasing its ability to help out smaller countries, certainly the dedication they showed toward uh, developing countries, uh, all I think uh, reflected well on the President's preparation and uh, the goodwill I think that he's carrying into this. That goodwill is going to carry over uh, into the summit here. Uh, certainly got on well with uh, the Latin American leaders that were present uh, at the G20 in London. Uh, good bilaterals uh, with the individuals. And he's helped a lot, I think, in this instance by the fact that he is going to be going to Mexico and by Secretary Clinton's trip to Mexico. In particular, uh, at least in my experience, the, the mere fact that Secretary Clinton acknowledged uh, the United States' role and responsibility in many respects in terms of uh, the drug violence in uh, Mexico and the economic repercussions of it uh, is helpful uh, in establishing a certain amount of credibility because what it does is recognize the reality of the situation. The question is whether that will carry over into the discussions about trade and recognize the same role in terms of Colombia um, and actually uh, lead to a discussion about how we move on the uh, FTAs that are currently before Congress, uh, that uh, Colombia and others are still seeking imp implementation uh, while we're hanging fire. It doesn't appear to be any move on part of the Clinton administration, or I'm sorry, on the part of the Obama administration to uh, push the implementing legislation through the Congress at this point. Um, trade is going to be a low-level priority given the positions that uh, the candidate stake, Obama the candidate staked out. Uh, but he will feel obliged, uh, certainly in Mexico, to follow through on the rhetoric of the campaign from Ohio um, in terms of asking for a renegotiation of certain parts of uh, the agreement. That, on the whole, is not actually a good sign. Uh, that's the downside in terms of uh, where we are. Uh, world trade is plummeting. Trade in the region is plummeting. And despite the sort of black name that the Washington consensus gets, uh, particularly from the political left, the reality is the policies adopted by the countries in Latin America led to a really sustained period of economic growth, about 3 percent uh, over the last decade, actually the strongest growth in the last 30 years, and in many respects have insulated them uh, from some parts of the downturn. Uh, Forward-looking countries like Peru have adopted trade strategies that really have embraced the globe and has given them a, great, a lot more economic stability in the face of uh, the current downturn in the United States economy. So in one sense, trying to unclog the arteries of trade would actually be a critical step, uh, but it's nowhere on the agenda. And I always feel like uh, going into one of these things, the smart thing to do is uh, just Google the, uh, the title of the summit uh, and see uh, which articles pop up about when they started to negotiate the declaration. And one of the first articles I saw recognized that they were coming to a conclusion about the declaration last September. Uh, <laughs> and just to point out, uh, the world we're living in economically now relative to last September is radically different. And I think in some respects that's a measure of the lack of focus on uh, the economic issues that matter. And that, in fact, would push back against rising protectionism not only in the United States but elsewhere in the region at this point. So let me stop there. Thank you and good morning. Uh, I wanted to add some points about the Caribbean and also the upcoming donors meeting in Haiti because Haiti will also be a side subject at the summit. Uh, for the Caribbean, uh, if Mexico and Canada are, are our land borders, the Caribbean was declared in 2003 a third border of the United States and that concept was really never carried through because of other problems that the U.S. was having in other areas of the world. But in fact, the Caribbean states all look to this summit. This is the first summit held in the Caribbean on an island uh, there to uh, revive a attention on the region because of several points. One, because the Caribbean is still an important energy platform and a potential platform particularly for renewable energy and in the case of Cuba for petroleum. Second, it's an environmentally vulnerable region. Sixty percent of all population in the Caribbean live on the coast, and any of us who read from the IPPC report of the UN to other reports on environment that in the next 30 to 50 years, most of the Caribbean will increase a three-foot sea level rise, which has tremendous implications for human security in the region. 
And uh, so we have this environmental vulnerability and energy platform, and then we have a third factor, which is that these islands, many of them are insufficiently diversified small economies that are affected not only by national disaster, but now the global economic downturn. And that has tremendous impacts, and so many of the economies are dependent on remittances from uh, citizens living in the U.S., also in Canada, but mainly in the U.S., and this will have a uh, severe uh, effect on economic growth. Uh, perhaps the only bright side for the Caribbean at this moment is that the reduction in petroleum prices over the last six months has relieved some of a burden, but 2008 overall was a very difficult year for the region because the social safety net monies, which would have been spent on human uh, uh, issues, had to go to pay large energy bills. Uh, we can talk a little bit about the subsidies that were given by Venezuela. Most of the Caribbean states, with the exception of Trinidad and Tobago, are members of Petro Caribe. But once again, that's another issue I'm sure that will be an important sidebar on the discussion of energy at the summit because of the lack of sustainability of that program, given the projections not only for oil output, of which Venezuela well, uh, while having one of the largest reserves, is not able to fulfill the demand that it has created in the region. Um, I'd also like to point out that renewable energy, which was a focus in the Bush administration under the U.S.-Brazil Biofuel Partnership, which focused on several Caribbean states, is also being incorporated into President Obama's pledge of an energy partnership in the Amer Americas, which is to advance the growth in clean energy. And the summit at Tr Trinidad and Tobago on uh, next week will certainly bring up this pledge and begin the discussions of a framework for implementation. Um, the overarching goal in the summit declaration, which, as Grant said, was prepared early on, was certainly to create a renewable and low-carbon energy uh, uh, area. In fact, the goal is 50 percent by 2050 reduction of greenhouse gases. It's a very ambitious goal given the economy right now. And, uh, you know, with that uh, kind of a problem. We're also going to see uh, many other relationships there. Poverty reduction, though, which is a major goal within the summit declaration, may be ameliorated in some ways if a renewable energy system gets started. Renewable energy is one of the best sources of job creations in the Caribbean. I have some data. I don't have to talk about it now about the number of jobs that would be created and the beneficiaries would certainly be a uh, labor force both uh, in the Caribbean and also the opportunity to bring in other types of industrial bases that relate to, uh, the, to the production of renewable sources of energy. Just one final note. In Haiti, because uh, there's also a sheet on the donor meeting coming up, uh, the relationship and the renewed focus on Haiti uh, that the Obama administration has placed on it, the high priority that the UN has placed on it, the visit of President Clinton uh, earlier in March with the Secretary General, uh, the famous report that economist Paul Collier did on the potential of the Haiti to become an industrial platform to the U.S. through the HOPE legislation that was passed in October of 2008 are certainly one of the more promising things that we see in an otherwise rather difficult economic picture on an island that was hit by Ike, Hannah, Gustav, and Faye, who are not friends on a TV show, but are the four hurricanes that destroyed the uh, island. And the re res resurrection of these cities is very, very difficult. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Love to take some questions. Mr. Condon. Uh, actually, uh, two questions, if I can. One, uh, uh, Peter, how much does uh, the president benefit at this early stage in the region just by not being George Bush. And I wanted to follow up with Grant on trade. I mean, it seemed like all the previous summits of the Americas, uh, American presidents went there talking about free trade, free trade, free trade. Uh, it doesn't seem to be on the agenda here. Is that because, as you seem to suggest, that it's that agenda succeeded uh, is it, or just it's not a priority for this president. Uh, is there any pressure on him on Colombia to get that in? Uh, I mean, what's happened to that? Right, sure. President Obama's popularity um, with public opinion in the region is a, is a major resource that he, he takes into the, uh, to the summit. Uh, in some of the polls done before, during the election, up to 85% of, of populations and or publics in certain countries in the region supported him, um, and uh, that will be uh, that will be a very important uh, 
resource uh, that he has. Uh, I'll be, all eyes, eyes will be strongly focused on him, on uh, his, uh, both what he, what he's, what he says in terms of, of U.S. policy in the region and also the way he relates with, uh, with, other, with other colleagues. He's the uh, top U.S. diplomat. Uh, I think his trip to Europe showed was a sort of presaged what, what uh, to look for in, um, in Trinidad and Tobago and in Mexico. Uh, George, is a really good question. Um, on the free trade front, it's not going to be a major issue. Um, in part, it is because it succeeded. In reality, a lot of what we ought to be doing trade-wise in the region uh, comes down to some very practical things of unclogging the arteries. It's things like infrastructure. It's things like transportation. It's things like a, a better telecommunications network uh, in a, a region that is shifting towards services like the rest of the global economy is. Uh, telecommunications is actually a transportation vehicle rather than a way of communicating with each other. Uh, since you uh, send your services down the wires. And so the sorts of things that would make sense to do right now don't necessarily have to involve the c classic things we've done, negotiate about tariffs or quotas or things like that. The other thing is that um, it's a, there's a growing recognition that to take full advantage of the agreements that have been reached on a regional basis, you have to start grappling with the things that lie beyond the border. Uh, you have to start grappling with the sorts of uh, things that you face internally. Uh, in terms of the institutional and physical infrastructure problems that you face. But to be blunt, the economic and political situation has changed radically in the United States as well as uh, in the hemisphere generally. You've had a, a stronger shift toward much more populist politics. Uh, certainly the idea of trade liberalization, I, you couldn't even mention the word free in relation to markets at the G20, for example, during so, you know, and that was a, a group of finance ministers and central bankers, so you can see it. And what's interesting, I think, you see in the United States in particular that that populism really affects both parties. It just comes out in two different debates. It comes out as a trade debate among Democrats and an immigration debate among Republicans. But it's the same insecurity being reflected there. And I think the economic crisis has heightened that. So there's less pressure, I think, on all sides to think about liberalization. The real question is what can you do to make sure that we don't see a rollback as a part of the process. And the irony about trade, of course, is that it's the best uh, defense is a good offense. Staying on offense is really what helps drive the process. That's what's missing, and that's what raises the concern that we're going to be rolling back. That's where Colombia comes in, uh, as is Panama. If the president made the statement uh, that you could uh, get up, move these things, work with Uribe, make sure that we got this through, it would be an enormous statement uh, in support not only of American leadership in the region, but a recognition that uh, we were part and parcel of, of the reasons for Colombia's decline and that offering another economic opportunity is part of the responsibility we share in resolving the crisis that, in part, our drug habits created in Colombia. So he could do that. Unfortunately, you know, what he was doing as candidate in terms of trailing around uh, Ohio with Sherrod Brown <laughs> and borrowing his brand name as a part of the process makes it very difficult for President Obama to do that. And so I don't expect it's going to come out of the region, and I don't expect it's going to come out of the summit, even though I think it's one of the absolutely essential things the president could do. Mexican trucking have them on the country? Sure does. Yeah. Um, now, this is an issue that, uh, you know, Mickey Canner uh, signed the agreement originally, the NAFTA agreement, and, and uh, President Clinton immediately walked away from the trucking provisions with deference to the Teamsters. So it's an old sort of uh, problem, but this is really what the Congress did in terms of ending the uh, program at Byron Dorgan's uh, sort of press uh, really has put him on the defensive. I think what people are seeing is that instead of being a, a paragon of virtue on trade, which I'm always skeptical that we are, but in this instance you're sort of down one going into the conversation. Um, so far from actually trying to do something that would promote trade as a part of this, we are in fact on the defensive on trade. I'd like to make just a quick comment about the framework of the summit process and trade. The, at the 1994 first summit of the Americas in Miami, it was determined that the nations of the region, it was laid out as a, as a goal would negotiate a free trade area of the Americas uh, in, in over a, a period of about 10 years. Um, that, that failed to happen, and the trade issue was almost laid to rest uh, in Mar del Plata in 2005, where there was no consensus on any kind of uh, uh, statement on trade 
um, at the um, at the event. This time around, if there's any kind of language on trade, and I, I haven't seen the declaration of uh, of commitment, if there's anything, even if it's a placeholder, it would be uh, it would be a step a step forward. But the idea of the free trade area of the Americas is is, is certainly not moving anywhere. Uh, two questions, please, for any of the speakers. If you could elaborate a bit more about the President's economic agenda at the summit, given all of the issues you've raised, is, is he going there with any specific asks, uh, any specific requests for commitment? Or put another way, how would he emerge and, and, and judge it as being successful? Uh, well, actually, I think there's a, a wonderful way to do that with the President's agenda, because the reality is, the region as a whole, despite its liberalization and the success of that over the last decade, after 20 years of tough times, um, we're still left with an uh, income distribution problem, a skew that's heavy. Um, it is uh, always going to contribute to a more populist politics until you find a way to address it. The President's domestic agenda is one that is designed to address that here. And it is the same set of issues that actually need to be addressed within the region. George and I were talking a little bit earlier about we're living in a world where if you can reduce a, uh, reduce a job to an algorithm, it's going to be done by a computer. And that means you have to raise the investment in human capital significantly. And while we have problems at the K through 12 level, we've got great universities. Throughout Latin America, you have some good universities. But overall, the investment in education is well below the norm and well below what you'd need to remain competitive in the global economy. So in one sense, the President has a built-in agenda that he could extend in the region. And it would have real resonance, not only with the political leaders in the region, but also with the people in the region. Let me, let me just add one point. I think what President Obama brings to the summit is the commitment out of the G20 for this $1 trillion that I think the two beneficiaries will be the Latin American region for borrowing and for Eastern Europe. So from that perspective, the carryover will be important. But there is also the reality, as uh, Grant said, that, for example, President Moreno of the Inter-American Development Bank says, if growth stayed stagnant, the number of people that would drop to the extreme poverty level per year would be about 15 million people a year. Now, that's pretty dramatic. And all of us who have lived through the lost decade that we saw uh, in the, about uh, 20 years ago, 10, 10 years ago, may actually begin to see that. And I think the message has to be delivered that we don't want to repeat the lost decades, that we want to learn the lessons. And mainly, the greatest losers in the lost decade were the education sector, yeah. where there was a tremendous drop in literacy, which is a correlate to development. So I think that those are the important things, is keeping the perception up and also talking about the facilities that were created at the G20 for Latin America to use in this time of crisis. Okay. I think pe people will be looking for the signs that the U.S. economy is going to recover. That's the recovery of the U.S. economy is the key factor, and everyone will be looking to President Obama for his description of, of how the, his plans are laid out and how they're going to, to be working, plus the other issues of, of avoiding avoiding protection um, and um, the uh, further um, further funds dedicated to the international financial organizations, the IMF, the IDB, for for loans. Um, and beyond that, what others what others have said about empowering people in the region, any kind of uh, announcement on possible programs, cooperation on energy security, education, all of those things would be very well received. The other topic I wanted to ask about was Cuba. If you could help frame that for us a little bit more. What is it that the nations are going to be debating, um, perhaps you know, privately more than, than publicly? Um, and, and just how do you expect that issue to, to play out and, and maybe um, uh, even overshadow some other issues there? There will be differences of opinion from the different countries. The, the, the countries close to, to um, Chavez, Chavez himself, Bolivia, Nicaragua, those, the ALBA countries, will, um, will be promoting a, uh, a very vigorous uh, change in policy to allow Cuba back into the summit process, to allow Cuba into, uh, into the OAS. Uh, for other countries in the region, there may be support for reaching out to Cuba, but not necessarily to that 
to that extent. The United States has already said that uh, it will not uh, end the embargo, that uh, this is not in the cards in the short in the short term. Indeed, there's legislation that, that prohibits the normalization of relations with Cuba as long as Raul Castro is in power and as long as there's no transition to democracy. And in fact, uh, the OAS, by certain documents and certain certain agreements that it's uh, that it's signed, would make Cuba's full participation extremely difficult. The Inter-American Democratic Charter that was signed in 2001 basically establishes democracy as the coin of the realm in in the countries of the OAS, and uh, that's a major impediment to uh, to Cuba's. Uh, reintegration. But the issue is going to be, I think, uh, strongly discussed. Yeah, if I could just add on, I think on the economic front, the early moves and the signals about uh, altering the embargo, at least with respect to travel, um, does play uh, in terms of a change in U.S. perspective about the region. And uh, you would hope that it would be followed with a more thoughtful approach to how you reintegrate Cuba. Uh, how do you try and provide the incentives that would draw uh, Cuba back in, in, in essence, to the family of nations? And as Peter was pointing out, that depends on political change in Cuba, which never been a, a big uh, believer that anything we do economically is going to alter political choices in a particular country. But having said that, th the fact is we've seen other instances like Nicaragua where we've had a change and we've drawn a country back into very close economic relationships with the United States as well as with the rest of the region. There's lots of lessons actually that could be learned and we could spend some time thinking about those uh, in the offing. That would be a good contribution. I don't see that on the horizon, but I think on the, on the margins of the meeting that's going to be the discussion. Yeah. Let me just add one point because you asked about framing. There are two things that I think will happen. This is an administration that is looking at multilateralism as an important part of its diplomatic tool. The fact that they're looking at the OAS and they're talking about a process is a change, and I think that's going to be important. And the second factor that may come out, because officially Cuba is not on the agenda, and I think in all the press briefings that I've read, there hasn't been a lot of discussion of that when asked on an official basis. We will be looking for interlocutors on this dialogue, as we have in the past, and I think we may come out with a stronger set of positive actors within the region. The fact that this is taking place in the Caribbean is important. There are going to be people in countries that are going to be very important to this transition, which is happening already. So I would just add those two points. Yeah, that's a very good point. Yeah, the G20. Uh, it, it, it did uh, provide those growth rates in some ways, but but in other ways it, it was seen as a way of widening the gap between rich and poor. It lifted some people from poverty, but because it relied on trade and export of resources and those kinds of things, and that mix of of, uh, of of free trade, smaller government privatizations, low debt, is now the exact opposite besides the trade of what the United States is doing. Right. It's taking on huge amounts of debt. Uh, the state is taking much more control of things. Will Obama? say to some of these governments that are moving to a much stronger state control of economies, yes, keep doing that, and those of you that aren't should continue to. I mean, this is obviously Chavez's mantra, statism. Will we see a, a, a complete reversal using the United States example uh, to take for the state to get much more involved in the economy? Well, two thoughts. Uh, first, as to our ability to serve as an advocate for free markets and smaller government right now, I was told when I was very young by my a uh, shop teacher that you can't reclaim your virginity simply by pulling your pants back up. And, uh, you know, the fact of the matter is going to be pretty pretty hard for us to... Yeah, <laughs> but it's pretty hard for us to, you know, go right now and pretend that, you know, the things that we were visiting, uh, or the World Bank or the IMF were visiting on Latin American countries in terms of fiscal discipline, monetary discipline, all those things that go with it, uh, is going to play at this point. So that's number one. Um, but the, more deeply, to be honest with you, for anybody who lived through those times, uh, the idea that there ever was a Washington consensus is just, n it's not really uh, a serious proposition. Uh, there were a set of policies that the World Bank and a number of economists uh, advocated, including at the IMF, uh, that were broadly consistent with simply trying to free people 
to have the economic opportunity. I started out my life as a foreign service officer in Mexico. It didn't take long to figure out that the reason that everybody was operating in the black market was because they literally couldn't afford to comply with the rules and pay the bribes. And the interesting thing about the dynamic that NAFTA has created is that it has actually liberated individuals in Mexico to pursue their economic interests there. And to the extent that that was the point of the Washington Consensus, it still is valid in terms of the region. And embracing that creation of that economic space, that freedom to actually engage in exchange, specialize, raise your own productivity, contribute to a rising standard of living, all that's still relevant. To the extent that it reflected a, a certain perspective of conditionality at the IMF about things like fiscal discipline and monetary discipline, that I think is dead, in part because we can't be terrific advocates of it right now. I, I, I'd like to add that the the policies that were that were uh, f forwarded by the Washington Consensus that were applied in the region, all of the monetary fiscal policies that have led to much stronger economies have allowed them to weather or to confront this crisis in a much in a much better situation than they would have been otherwise without massive currency problems monetary problems the fact that the debt is low the fact that reserves are generally high it allows them to increase their spending on social on, on social programs over at least the short haul to to meet the crisis and hopefully when the world economy begins to recover they'll be in a better better situation. So I'm not sure that there's sort of a revisiting of some of these basic uh, fiscal monetary policies um, and, and the way of, of conducting the macroeconomic uh, uh, policy in the region. Um, but definitely they're going to have to adjust to a, a tough political environment where unemployment is going up and, uh, and where GDP is, is being scaled back in every country. Maybe I could just add one more thing. Peter, you reminded me that um, there's one, one good, very concrete example. Today in Mexico, uh, there is a government bond market which allows the government to borrow in pesos rather than dollars, so it's not exposed to the exchange rate risk the way it was early on. Uh, and there's a corporate bond market. Uh, it's unique, actually, in Latin America. But it, it, it is there in part because of the fiscal discipline and monetary discipline the Mexican government showed after the Testa Bono crisis in 1994 uh, to restore credibility, but also the institutional policy changes, of which their ability to play off the stability in the U.S. market because of the NAFTA agreement was absolutely central to it. So when you think about the constellation of policies of trade liberalization, fiscal discipline, monetary discipline, you can point to a concrete example where it really has paid off for Mexico, so it's not exposed to the risks it was in the 1970s, the 1980s, when I lived there, the 1990s. And so in that sense, um, many of the things that people were talking about that get blamed on the Washington consensus are just as Peter said, they've become bulwarks against worse economic times. And in that sense, I don't see them being revisited at this point. They've sort of proven the test of time. Okay, just a quick follow. Uh, uh, on the IMF, uh, I thought it was ironic that the day the Washington Consensus was declared dead, the IMF got about a trillion dollars, considering it was the chief enforcer of it, uh, as viewed by a lot of these countries. Will the stigma on the IMF be, be – is, is it gone now for these countries? Will there be more people borrowing? Will, there, will they invite the IMF to come and, and get involved again, or is it still going to be seen as this uh, sort of interloper? Let me, and I'm sure both Peter and Grant have other views, but the, the trillion-dollar package that was released, I mean, Mexico immediately went and said they were mm -hmm. going to borrow off this uh, uh, new uh, facility. Uh, I think you have to separate the IMF and the Washington cons consensus as an ideological issue, which fueled the um, left in Latin America and in the United States on Latin American policy versus the reality of what the IMF does as a global financial police agency and in a crime of crisis is going to be used. I mean, the serious economists and the serious government officials in all Latin American countries are going to be looking to the IMF. I mean, I think what you have to look at is this is a region with great income inequality, perhaps the greatest in the world, and the sources of those are not from the Washington consensus. The sources of those have to do with many other issues that Grant and Peter have mentioned, from bad infrastructure planning, poor telecommunications, lack of investment in education, lack of access to different types of programs. Some of them are changing. There are cash transfer programs in some countries, like Mexico, uh, where, which have been successful. But those are not 
the Washington consensus problems, and I think there's a tendency to aggregate all of them under one title. And I th really believe that the IMF is going to be a godsend, both for Latin America and for Eastern Europe. I, I would just say I, I meant more the perception of it. I mean, I think, as you, as you said, the officials and the economists certainly know what the IMF does and does not do, but it was such a, a political lightning rod. And people made so much hay out of this during the time. I'm wondering if you can roll that back to some degree and now have politicians saying, guess what, we just got, you know, $50 billion from the IMF. Isn't that exciting when, they've, when for years you've been telling people that the IMF is kind of the root of all evil? They don't call economics the dismal science or anything, Scott. I mean, I think that <laughs> nobody gets excited about uh, the IMF. And, and there's less stigma if the Lulas and others of this world can claim that they have a greater mm -hmm. say within the IMF and that in the governance of the IMF, the, uh, the, the BRICS and other countries have a, a bigger role. Yeah, I guess, I guess what I'd say, Scott, is that you really do have a, um, a problem politically to make the turn uh, to suddenly embrace the IMF. Um, the IMF, if it keeps its narrow, func narrow function on balance of payments and uh, has a little bit more heterodox approach to the individual economies, uh, is likely to succeed in the region, uh, but it's never going to be embraced. I mean, that's like embracing the dentist. <laughs> America's culpability in terms of the uh, drug wars and the violence and for again for those of us watching the campaign this was sort of a surprise it just wasn't on the table can you speak to that number one and two um, can you talk about America's responsibility here in terms of um, the consumption of illegal drugs drugs incurred um, fueling the problems we've seen in Mexico and also the um, the transportation or the movement of weapons from north to south because of um, uh, straw purchases and, and things like that. I mean, what is America's culpability on some of these uh, issues? The, the blame game on drugs has been going on for a long time in Latin America. Uh, I'm a veteran of, of Colombia and, and uh, all of the, for the denial of, of, you know, whose responsibility was what and, and throwing, casting the blame on. I think there's a greater sense of sharing the responsibility and that was very clearly stated by Secretary uh, Clinton that indeed if the United States is, is U.S. demand is driving the, the drug, uh, drugs, then uh, we, have a, we have an important role. Um, and this is something that, that, that on the security side and the arms side, Johanna and I worked uh, on this a lot. And I'll, I'll let her uh, talk about that. But, but um, uh, I think the, the positions that the U.S. takes on trying to stem the flow of illegal, uh, the illegal flow of guns will, will be a major factor in uh, reassuring Mexico of ours, our dedication to cooperation on this issue. I think you know, to answer on the flow of weapons, uh, it's going to have to take a interagency effort in the United States, not only the State Department, but Homeland Security, uh, Justice Department, to, to begin to enforce laws that are on the books. The Mexicans have a very tight gun control law, and they are not the source of the problem, but certainly they're the beneficiaries of our own weak problems at the border, the ability to buy guns at gun shows without background checks. And we're not the only people who are selling. I mean, the weapons that were found in some of the cartel cash came from Hungary, they came from China, so that, you know, it's an arms bazaar in itself at the border. And I think the immediate challenge is to reassure with some important symbol. And uh, Peter and I wrote about this treaty that has been lingering in the U.S. Senate since the late 1990s, the uh, control of firearms, the SIFTA agreement, which could possibly become a talking point, but more than a talking point, an actionable talking point that the President might refer to when he is uh, visiting in Mexico next week. And I would 
certainly be looking out for that. But symbols are symbols and actions are actions. I think the fact that the President uh, has announced, I think with great courage, that he's going to take on immigration policy as a promise that he made to the Hispanic community during the campaign, since you asked about the campaign, is uh, certainly a very courageous act at a time when he's also trying to solve a global economic crisis, a nuclear crisis with North Korea, and a uh, very difficult uh, situation at the U.S. border. I, I, let me just add two things. One is uh, a very practical, concrete thing, which is and I think there's been such an intense focus since 9-11 on what's coming in the country, uh, rightfully so in many respects, that we've neglected what's going out of the country. Uh, there is something called the Arms Export Control Act. When you send one of these things abroad, you are obliged to get an export license. Anybody who's dealt with that bureaucracy at the State Department knows it's undermanned, knows it has to depend on the Customs Service to for the enforcement aspects. It's not like you have people at the State Department running around with guns. Frankly, for those of us who used to work in the State Department, you wouldn't want that, you know. <laughs> but the reality is, is that we have not done a credible job and because our focus has been elsewhere. And as a consequence, now, you know, times change, events change, perceptions change about what the threat is. And I think what we're recognizing is that the porousness of the border works both ways. And that actually is a very helpful thing to understand, because going to Peter's point, it is a shared responsibility. The border is actually a third country. Uh, it's something where the flow there, as Joanna's pointing out, is something that you don't see elsewhere in Mexico and you don't see elsewhere in the United States. You've got to come to grips with that together. So the steps they've taken so far is helpful. The negative thing I have to say is the utter hypocrisy of assuming responsibility for the drug flow, not actually doing much about the demand side of the equation. And oh, by the way, then saying to Mexico we want to renegotiate the NAFTA with respect to labor and the environment, ignoring the fact that we need this agreement in part both to stem the tide of illegal immigration as well as to address the economic consequences of our drug demand. Um, just a quick follow-up. Um, it, it just seems like it's been impossible for the United States to, to win this drug war in terms of stopping the drug flow from south to north. Um, should the United States be? What can the United States do on the demand side? And should legalization of some drugs be on the table? It's a possible option. I think you're aware that I think three Latin American former presidents have already talked about the legalization of marijuana. So the issue is on the table in a regional discussion. Nothing has come from our side. And there is a lot of attention being paid to the incarceration rates that are first-time offenders, that Senator Webb has now created a commission on crime that will look at that as well. So I think there's a recognition that we, we need to address it. I think what's interesting in this moment is that there's a separation now between the war on drugs, which was the mantra of our relationship, with the other issues that are socioeconomic based that are related not so much to the drug war, but to the economic inequalities, the joblessness that so many youth have, the youth bulge that exists in Central America, which creates an enabling environment for gangs. These are things I think, and uh, none of us mentioned, and I think Peter and I had talked about, the public safety, which is a key issue in the summit agenda. This is mm. one of the issues that right. all of the regions, Central America and Mexico, are looking at, but also the rest of Latin America. So. I think the ability of President Obama to deliver a clear message that we are concerned with safety and security aside from the drug issue, which is important and related but not one and the same, may give the leaders of the region a new way to address some of the basic problems that are responsibilities of states themselves. The, the, the key goal is to empower the, the capabilities of the state to be able to deal with the functions that a normal state would and to be able to defend the state against the effects of widespread international crime or, or, or organized crime, drug trafficking, um, to the extent that Mexico is able, for example, to strengthen its police force and not have to be able to use tens of thousands of military people to combat uh, the, uh, the, the, the crime syndicates in Mexico uh, is important. All through Central America, as Johanna mentioned, the need for strengthened state presence. If there's been a lesson from Colombia, it's been that. And um, when, the, when society and state institutions and the state itself are able to uh, project legitimate authority, that, then that, that lessens the amount of space open to, uh, to the drug traffickers. I guess I just add two thoughts. One, a growing economy uh, in the United States and elsewhere uh, means there's other economic opportunities. That would be one enormously helpful step that everybody could collaborate on. More concretely, 
even though I'm a libertarian by instinct because of my skepticism of political power, um, it doesn't go as far as the legalization of drugs. But how you cope with quote-unquote offenders of these sorts of crimes who do incidentally visit negative consequences on people in their own homes, in their own communities, and in the region, um, doesn't mean you have to do it through prisons. And I think that's part of what Senator Webb is talking about. I mean, obviously an investment in uh, trying to encourage people off of uh, the substance is a far better thing. You know, trying to make sure that our national parks aren't home to meth labs would be another good thing. <laughs> you know, there's a whole host of things, but it really does take a different mindset about the problem that we have and thinking of it not purely as an issue of criminal enforcement. And that in and of itself actually would be better. I'm always reminded of a friend of mine who actually grew up in the Nancy Reagan years uh, going through school when it was just say no. And he said it actually had a profound effect. You know, the irony is, is that you had a generation where drug use declined. Uh, those are the sorts of things that we ought to focus on. And obviously, you know, where we are in our prison system ought to tell us that as well. Just one last point on your question. The opportunity that's before us with creating a national health system and looking at our entire health policy is probably going to be the place where you're going to see greater emphasis on treatment. Uh, the First Lady has talked about it. The President has mentioned it in the context of treatment. So I think we have a convergence of opportunities, both on immigration and on national health, to begin to deal with the uh, treatment question as well. Hi, Alexander Duncan with Platts. Um, you touched on this earlier, energy and the environment, and I was wondering uh, where you anticipate this ranking amongst all of the, the many priorities that are going to be discussed, um, not, just, uh, not just at the Summit of the Americas, uh, but in Mexico as well. And also, which countries do you anticipate President Obama going to personally, offering to extend a hand in terms of um, development of their resources, whether it's oil, natural gas or renewables, which is clearly a huge priority for him domestically. Well, and, and I'm sure you're aware of, uh, that the U.S. Biofuels Agreement, which had four countries initially, which were the Dominican Republic, Haiti, St. Kitts and Nevis, and El Salvador, has been expanded into Honduras and also into Nicaragua. And the sense will be that there will be even greater interest because the Department of Energy uh, is following up. In fact, there will be a meeting in June in Lima to follow up on some of the implementable components of the Energy Accord. Uh, the other area, and of course, which is a sore point and isn't going to be resolved at this summit, is the U.S.-Brazil uh, tariff issue on ethanol. But given the uh, priorities, uh, my sense is that energy and climate are going to be rolled into a broader discussion that uh, the President will take, not only to the region, but on a global basis. Uh, there is great progress in the Americas on renewable energy, but the amount even uh, that will be produced, it still will only be 7 percent of the transport needs over the next uh, 20 years. The real challenge will be whether there is enough investment money for countries like Brazil to exploit the pre-salt oil that it found off the shore in Santos, whether there will be additional resources to develop oil off in the Caribbean that Cuba already has several uh, international actors uh, seeking the uh, sites in the uh, Caribbean. Uh, so I don't know that you can rank it as a priority, but it will be folded into the climate agenda and the uh, low carbon goal, which is stated in the summit declaration, is going to be the driving force. Yeah, if I could just add, uh, um, the, the, this is one area where people can agree, generally. Uh, and so I think you'll see a lot of focus on the idea of how do we create a more sustainable energy picture as well as move toward energy security, but it won't move beyond the abstract level for precisely the reason that you want to describe until you're willing to confront, you know, the fan jewels in Florida and American sugar in the Red River Valley, which is currently being flooded. Um, you're not going to come to grips with it. Of course, the congressman who is the chairman of the House Ag Committee is from Detroit Lakes, Minnesota, uh, which is right in the heart of, you know, the sugar beet uh, part of our country. So. Uh, if you think about all the other things on the President's agenda economically, the idea that this is the time to cross swords with the uh, farm lobby, probably not going to happen, right? The one thing I would say is that, and this is a much more serious problem, is that for all the things we'd like to do on energy and the environment, um, 
in one sense, uh, the decline in economic activity has actually had the biggest impact on reducing CO2 emissions of anything we could have done. It's not a happy state of affairs to be solving your carbon problems by, you know, engaging in a global recession. Uh, but what it also does is drive the price down, which means in terms of renewables and the other sorts of alternatives, there's a much less incentive and therefore also a higher cost politically and economically to pursue a renewable strategy. So the idea that we'll reach the 7 percent in light of the very low price of uh, classic carbon fuels at this point, I'm a little skeptical that it'll happen. It's not an issue that'll come up, but it's one that will hang in the background and it'll inhibit the ability to actually reach a broader agreement, unfortunately. Well, thanks very much for coming today, and uh, our experts will be available while you're on the trip. Transcript will be out uh, this afternoon, late this afternoon, probably close of business. Uh, and thanks for coming to the Center for Strategic International Studies. Appreciate it.